Over the last year, the Racial Justice and Healing Team has been developing an experimental program that addresses the history of racism in Richmond from a faith perspective called Walking with the Enslaved, the Church's Role in Slavery, inspired by Richmond's Trail of Enslaved Africans. A recent exciting development that I, I'm really thrilled to share with you is that St. Philip's, the historically black Episcopal church in Richmond, has agreed to partner with us on this endeavor. And yesterday, members of both St. Philip's and St. Paul's vestries participated in a pilot version of Walking with the Enslaved, which was a big deal. <laughs> and something new that I learned on our walk was that Lumpkin Slave Jail was just one of 20 or so nondescript windowless brick warehouses along the narrow steep alley running through Shaco Bottom between Franklin and Maine, referred to as Wall Street, just five blocks from St. Paul's. And rather than outside in the light of day, it was behind the closed doors of these anonymous buildings that an estimated 300,000 enslaved persons were bought and sold downriver in the mid-19th century, becoming the main engine of Richmond's economy for 30 years. And what is even more gobsmacking, although I don't even have words for it, is that this history was hidden, hidden, and literally physically buried from the end of the Civil War until 2007. So some of the questions we were asked to reflect on included, what happens when the truth is not told and history is hidden? What are the consequences? David's tragic story, which reaches its climax in our passage from 2 Samuel, also explores these questions, though it might not be obvious at first. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've read about how David, at the pinnacle of his power as king of Israel, commits adultery with Bathsheba, wife of one of his most loyal soldiers, Uriah. And when David learns Bathsheba is pregnant, he orders that Uriah be killed on the front lines of battle to cover up his offense and then takes Bathsheba as his wife. But David is called to the mat by his royal prophet, Nathan, who confronts the king with God's judgment that what David has done is evil in the Lord's sight. David immediately admits his transgression before God. And while God forgives David, God does not spare David from the consequences of his actions. Nathan says on behalf of the Lord, now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house. Rather than God's punishment of David, I interpret Nathan's prophecy from God as a recognition of the hard reality that David's sins have unleashed a catastrophic chain reaction in the lives of those linked closely with his. As it goes so often, David's cover-up and denial of what happens is more destructive than his original offenses. Beyond the acknowledgement of his wrongdoing before the prophet Nathan and the Lord, there's no evidence in the text that David ever confesses the truth of what he did to the people most affected. Bathsheba, Uriah's family, his own family, and his inner circle of officials, or his nation for that matter. Without such acknowledgement, David then becomes paralyzed by denial, unable to engage in any meaningful repentance, change of heart and mind, or reconciliation with those whom he has hurt. When the newborn he and Bathsheba conceived falls gravely ill, David just returns to life as normal after the baby dies, as if nothing has happened. When he hears that his eldest son has violently committed incest with his daughter, Tamar, Amnon's half-sister, David is angry, 
but he remains silent. He does nothing. When he hears that his second eldest son, Absalom, murders Amnon to avenge Tamar's violation, David mourns and passively lets Absalom escape. But the king pines for his estranged son, allowing him to return from exile only for the baleful Absalom to orchestrate a rebellion to usurp David's throne right from under his father's nose. With Absalom's coup imminent, David and his military are forced to flee the city. Invading Jerusalem, Absalom gloats in his conquest by ravaging all ten of David's wives left behind in the palace. But in the end, David's experienced military prevails, outwitting and defeating the insurgents in a gruesome slaughter of 20,000 men. And after the battle, when some of David's men happen upon Absalom dangling from a tree in the forest, ensnared by his own hair, they waste no time brutally executing the king's traitorous son, despite David's request that they deal gently with the young man. Upon learning Absalom is dead, David is unhinged. In one of the most dramatic and reach wrenching expressions of human grief in scripture, David weeps and repeatedly cries out his son's name. Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son Absalom, I would have died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son. Absalom's death cracks David's inner dam of denial, unleashing a torrent of pain and agony for all that has been lost, one child dead, two sons slain, a daughter brutalized, ten wives violated. David's story shows us how individual sin, when hidden, perpetuates and metastasizes into family systems and social structures of sin. But it's not only that David denies the truth of his actions and their consequences that leads to such disaster. It's that David denies God's mercy and becomes his own moral arbiter. So while God forgives David, as we read about and Charlie preached so beautifully about last week. David never forgives himself. He collapses all reality in upon himself, consumed by shame and guilt, blind to the fact that he alone is incapable of bringing about his own and others' redemption without God's mercy. The psalmist cries, O oh, Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. And we will pray, Lord, hear our prayer, for your mercy is great. And we confess, have mercy upon us, most merciful God. What do we mean by all of this mercy talk? Here's a description that I love from a, a, a theologian whose name I can't pronounce, who's gone to glory. <laughs> the prayer for mercy is not a prayer for forgiveness, not a prayer for strength, or for help in the changing fortunes of life, or a prayer for any particular gift from God, but a cry to God's self a prayer to God's heart, implying the one who is enfolded in the heart of God needs nothing more. I like to think that when Jesus says he is the bread of life, that he is the incarnation of God's mercy, the living bread come down from heaven upon which our existence entirely depends is sustained and is redeemed. So this has all made me reflect 
on my own family history. I come from what I call a blue blood, waspy, southern gothic, dysfunctional family from Middle Tennessee, where many, many secrets have accumulated over the generations. I was almost 40 when I discovered that my paternal great-great-grandmother's family enslaved other human beings. And more recently, I learned that my maternal great-great-grandfather had an illegitimate child with his black maid. And you know, the more greats you go back, the more of them you have. So God only knows what the other ones <laughs> have done. But it's my conviction that such hidden histories of my white forebears dehumanizing black people has a lot to do with the intergenerational afflictions my family has suffered, including addiction, alcoholism, mental illness, depression, and broken relationships all over the place. And while we benefited materially from whiteness, yeah, we sure did, we have been damaged spiritually by a destructive culture of denial and its true cost to our black siblings. Now, I'm only aware of some truths of my family's story, but the consequences live on within me. As Dawood Bey says, history is always present. I have grappled with the trauma and shame of growing up in a pretty messed up family system for most of my life. Love my family as I do, <laughs> and I do. But for so long, I was convinced that I alone was responsible for fixing my family and myself. And it was only brought to my knees in an extremely painful period when I turned 30 and had a breakdown due to a failed relationship that I realized all my best efforts to overcome my family's history were in vain. They were useless. The only option left to me was to throw myself upon the mercy of God. And God delivered me. The tender mercies of God saved me and gave me my life back. A resurrection of sorts. I wouldn't be standing here in this pulpit today if it weren't for God's mercy. And I was free at last, enfolded in the heart of God's love, to risk real change, healing, forgiveness, and reconciliation with myself and others. And of course, this is, was not a one and done event. This has been an ongoing lifetime process of spiritual growth and awakening for me only possible with God's help. This is why I am so convinced, so convicted that the only true solution that will save our society from the ravaging sin of structural racism is a spiritual one. As we visited Shaco Bottom and the I-95 corridor near Gilpin Court, where Jackson Ward was so violently severed, the cover-up has been just too insidious, too pervasive, the damage too far-reaching for us to rectify by our human moral autonomy alone. Only God can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Only the wideness of God's mercy is enough to overcome this history of injustice and sin. The church's calling has never been more urgent or clear. We are equipped like no other social institution to create a countercultural space for people to authentically engage in spiritual reflection and inner heart work of truth-telling and change. St. Paul's good news story of transformation around our racial past creates a uniquely powerful witness to and an opportunity for us to be that spiritual center for racial healing in Richmond by offering programs like the History Tours, which you can join after our service at the Font, the Stations of St. Paul's, and Walking with the Enslaved. 
enfolded in the merciful heart of God. May we, as a body of Christ, be a place where all are invited to put away falsehood, speak truth to our neighbors, remembering that we are members of one another, imitators of God, living in love as Christ loved us. Amen.